Bruchem Aboyim, thank you very much for coming. Uh, tonight's lecture will be on the question of can we question God um, on a personal level. This week was the unveiling for my younger brother um, who passed away 11 months ago. He had everything to live for. He was in good shape, still working, worked out, had a lovely family, father, grandfather. He was only 67. In fact, on the day that he died, he worked out that morning and was getting to go to work. He just passed away. The truth is it really made no sense. But who said life has to make sense to us? There are many things in life that we don't understand. The first question that an irreligious person asks you when he finds out that you're an Orthodox Jew, how could God allow six million Jews to be killed? The Holocaust. And even more so, many of the Holocaust survivors have said to me again and again, all the good ones died. So how do we understand it? Are we supposed to live only on faith? God gave us a brain. He did so for us to be able to understand the universe that we live in. Psychologists and sociologists tell us that if a person is really using his brain to capacity, they are only using about 20% of that capacity of the brain. So the question becomes, why would God give us the remaining 80% if we can't use it? The answer may well be that we have the ability to understand God on a much higher level. However, our physicality gets in the way. We are human beings. And everything that we do and think connects to our physical lives. We think of God in physical terms. And he communicates with us using terms that we as humans would understand. For example, the hand of God, as if he had a body. <clears throat> or God's anger, as if he has emotions says God saw, as if he has eyes with which to see. One might compare our relationship with God Almighty as being similar to that of a mother who is a nuclear scientist. When she wants to connect to her little baby, she leans over his crib and says things like gaga boo boo, and the baby coos. She is far from gaga boo boo, but she wants to connect with her infant child. And so she communicates in a way that her baby will and can react to her. She can talk to the infant about her knowledge of nuclear science, <laughs> but that really wouldn't accomplish anything. The infant, infant wouldn't really even respond. You know, there was an essay that was written by Samuel Johnson called The Educated Man. His thesis was that an educated man can talk to anyone. If you can only talk to educated people, those with very high IQs, then you really are not an educated person because it's much more difficult and requires much more knowledge to communicate with someone who is not educated or as smart as you are. And that is the reason that God has given us a Torah with stories and instructions that even a young child can understand. He wants to communicate with us on whatever level we may be from five to 85. The Torah is an instruction manual. If we are not able to understand it on different levels, it really would be useless. God and his Torah are one. Studying the Torah is not like reading a book. God has given us a blueprint of his wisdom, and on whatever level we are on, we can glean from its instruction. God wants us to ask questions. After all, if all he wanted of us is blind faith, then all we would need would be the book of Vayikra. Do this and don't do that. End of story. But it says in the Alenu prayer that we say three times daily, taken from the verse in the book of Devorim, in the portion of Oaschana in 439, That's what the Pasuk says. And you shall know this day, you shall ponder it in your heart. The Adata Hayom alludes to our intellect. God is so to speak, playing hide and seek with us. He expects, expects us to use our brains to find him and to come to the realization that it is he and only he who directs all that is in this world and that we are honored and privileged to be able to serve him. 
However, there are things in life that we do not nor can we understand. Then, Vahashivos Elavavecha, the second part of the Pasuk. And you shall ponder it in your heart. Faith. Intellect can only take you so far. When we hit that wall, we don't understand, then we have no choice but to believe that God is a benevolent Father who only wants us to be happy and succeed. Sometimes that love translates into him saying no because that is the right answer. Much like a father telling his young child that he has had enough candy <laughs> but the child disagrees. The child cries. The child is angry with his parent. But the, the word no was for the child's benefit. Children have no concept of what it is to be a, an adult. They only understand things that they can relate to. I remember when my son was in kindergarten. He came home one day and seemed a bit confused. And so I asked him, how was your day? He told me that his class had gone to see the first grade classroom that day. So I said to him, wow, that must have been interesting. He said, Dad, there were no toys. That was his observation. There really are not that many years between a parent and his child. And yet, there is a world of knowledge and understanding between them. Imagine the gap between a human being and God. It is inconceivable. As the Rambam states, if I could understand God, I would be God. On the other hand, the Rambam in his Sefer on Mitzvot gives reasons for all the mitzvot. Are these the reasons why God has commanded us to keep these laws? Maybe not. But it helps us to be able to find some reasonable explanation as to why God would want us to do something. What if we don't agree? Then we do the mitzvah because it is Ratzon Hashem, just because it's the will of God. Much like a parent telling his child what is expected of him, it is not predicated on the child's understanding. Many of the 613 commandments of the Torah are logical. But there are a group of mitzvahs called chukim, statutes. They are not based on human logic. We do them because God has commanded us to do so. I think that in a way, these are really are the most logical of all the commandments. They teach us that not everything in this world is understandable. Sometimes, we just have to do something because that's how it is, whether we agree or not. Though we may not understand something today, doesn't mean that we will not understand it tomorrow. Some people have to fix everything. <laughs> not everything in life is fixable. Sometimes you just have to move on. Think of it as taking an exam. There are a hundred questions. You're stuck on question number three. So what do you do? You just stop and ponder on the answer, letting the time expire for taking the exam, and you flunk. The correct way to handle the exam would be to continue with the rest of the questions. And if there is time, go back and look at the question again. You might well have the answer. And what if you don't? <laughs> 99 is a pretty good score. So, getting back to it. The question, can we question God? I found a story, I think, that maybe gives us the best answer. This is supposedly something that had happened over a half century ago, the early years of the state of Israel. There was a far left Zionist party that was called the uh, Mapai party. And a leading member of that party also serves as director of a large Mapai li library that was in Tel Aviv. And he would frequently travel around the world in search of books and funds and supporters. On more than one occasion, his travels brought him to New York, to the United States, and he stayed in Crown Heights, a section of Brooklyn. He stayed at the home of a prominent Lubavitch Chassid, whose name was Rabbi Binyamin Klein, who often hosted important Israeli dignitaries. So one year, his visit coincided with Yom Kippur. And although he was entirely secular, he was an intellectual and a bit of an adventurer. 
And so he put on his talit and took a magzor and joined the Jews in this large shul at 770. And he found it a bit amusing that people in the 20th century still prayed. And while the others were davening and crying, he was looking at all the verses and examining every idea in the magzor. He found most of the ideas the same as any other sidur. But when he reached the section of the Asuri Mak Malkus, the Ten Martyrs, he stopped and he was taken back. He said out loud, this is insane. The Moxer tells the story of Ibekiba and nine other great Rabbanim, great, great, great sages who were publicly tortured to death by the Romans on Yom Kippur, each in a different way. But the part that shook him the most was when he read how the heavenly angels complained to God bitterly and saying, is this the reward for learning the Torah? God answered them and he said, be quiet. One more word and I'll return the world to tohu vavohu, to emptiness and voidness. The man was indignant. Is it forbidden to ask questions? Is God so cruel? that he would destroy the whole world just because someone asked a question? What sort of religion suppression is this? The men around him could not answer his question, and so he was directed to an old chassid that was sitting in the corner for a proper answer. The chassid listened to the question. Mm. He said, an excellent question. And for every good question, there is a good answer. <clears throat> so the old chassid began to speak, and he said, let me tell you a parable. There was once a great king who had a Jewish tailor. Ah, he loved his tailor very much and valued both his talent as a tailor and also his opinion on all matters. He found him to be very bright, very astute. However, the local bishop uh, couldn't stand the Jew. He hated him with passion and longed for the moment he could eliminate him, but without angering the king. And the bishop was a very clever man and he thought up a scheme to do away with the tailor. What he did is he bought a large piece of the finest white satin cloth and personally presented to the king, proclaiming that it was holy cloth from the church, sanctified by heaven. The finest garment may be fashioned from this cloth, the bishop said. However, the law of the scripture is that if even a single thread of this holy cloth would be missing from the finished garment, then the responsible party must die. The king took the cloth, admired it. He then gave it to his faithful Jewish tailor <clears throat> without even bothering to tell him the warnings of the bishop. He trusted him completely and felt that such a threat might make him nervous and disturb his work. And he wanted it to done magnificently. You know, they tell the story of Josephine, the wife of Napoleon, when she was giving birth to their child. No midwife in Paris would deliver her child. They had to dress her up in the clothes of a peasant woman and take her outside of the city to find a midwife that would deliver the child. They were all afraid something might happen. And so too, the king did not tell the tailor about the warning. Two weeks later, the garment was finished and presented to the king. It was even more exquisite than the king had imagined. So expertly sewn that not a stitch could be seen anywhere. It was the ultimate in beauty and elegance. Huh. The king was overjoyed and rewarded the Jew handsomely. That evening, the bishop paid a visit to the king. He was accompanied by 10 priests, high ranking. They swore on all that was holy, that there was conclusive evidence that the tailor had appropriated seven, several small scraps from the garment for ritual use. As a result, the tailor must die. The king now had no choice. He was bound by the holy oath and with a heavy heart he had the tailor, tailor bound and chained and he said he was to be killed for the theft of holy cloth. Taylor tried to protest but it was useless. His fate was sealed. With nothing to lose the tailor made one last request from the king. And he said, Your Majesty, may I have one last request before I die? The king agreed. And the tailor asked for a pair of scissors. The king warned him not to damage the garment and then warily gave him the scissors. 
And the tailor proceeded to very delicately take apart the entire garment, stitch by stitch. He laid the pieces side by side until he had restored the entire cloth, the entire cloth to its original shape. Not one thread was missing. You see, Your Majesty, he said. The bishop thought that it was impossible for nothing to be lost in the cutting, but he was wrong. My God helped me, and I used every bit of cloth. See for yourself. Not one bit of cloth is missing. And that concluded the old chassid as he looked at the spellbound Israeli guest is the end of the parable and the answer to your question. God wasn't telling the angels not to ask questions. Rather, he was telling them that when he created the world, he did it with a plan and nothing, absolutely nothing is missing from that plan. But in order for anyone to understand his plan, it would be necessary to take everything apart. For the angels to understand the reason for the tragedies, God would have to undo the entire creation and the world would have to revert back to nothingness and that needed to be done for anyone. The only way that could be seen is go back to the beginning. When we think that we can come up with an answer that we can understand, the only way to understand what God has done is from the beginning. So in the end, it is our job to serve God, to love him as a benevolent father, to try to find logic in all that we do, not for him, but because it makes it easier for us to fulfill his wishes. We need to know, and in the end believe, that all that God does for us, all that he has commanded us, is for our benefit, not his. And with that, may we merit to usher in the coming of Mashiach Sikainu, quickly and in our time. Thank you very much for coming. Shabbat Shalom.